This lab has to do with going over some internet tools that are available to the biochemist or to someone who's interested in structural biology, molecular biology, genetics, gene sequences, etc. So there's a number of databases that I thought I'd go over in this workshop. And here are some practice problems that allow you to actually use some of these website tools. There are two websites that I generally follow. One is called Expasi. That actually has links to several types of websites. Some of those links are dead. Um, and then another one that's actually from the United States government, and that is the NCBI, National Center for Biotechnology and, and Information. So if you click on that, you should be able to go directly to the NCBI website. And here you have a repository of all sorts of DNA sequences, RNA sequences, and protein sequences. Since we're studying proteins in this module, I thought we'd look up some protein sequences, do some alignments, and predict uh, their structures. So first thing you want to do is look at the database under all databases and look for proteins. And under search, you should be able to search for any or all proteins that are in this data bank. So let's start our first question here, and that is to look up the primary amino acid sequence. So one important thing to look at or notice is this format, and it's called FASTA. And a FASTA format is generally the way that we utilize to manipulate these large data sets. In this case, we're talking about large data sets of amino acids. And the second term that you want to be familiar with is primary amino acid sequence. The primary amino acid sequence, as we mentioned in class, is the linear chain of amino acids. So it's just a chain of letters. So it's asking for the primary amino acid sequence of the following proteins, human and mice lysozyme. So in order to do that, I'll just go to the NCBI website and I'll type human lysozyme. And I should get several deposits of human lysozyme. And I'll use the, this one. You notice that I have several of these. You want to be cognizant of how many amino acids you want to look up because, again, these are just deposits. These are just deposits from labs all across the world who have put their amino acid sequence on there. So you want to look for a reasonable number of amino acids. And 148 amino acids does sound like a reasonable amount for the number of amino acids in lysozyme. So I'll just click on the lysozyme precursor for Homo sapiens. So the genus and species of humans is Homo sapiens. And you get all of this information concerning that sequence deposit. If you look all the way down, here you have the primary amino acid sequence, and that is what the question is asking for. But you can also look at other sites within the protein. So for example, if you're interested in the site that is involved in the actual catalysis of what lysozyme does, you'll click on this. And if you notice, all that is highlighted in brown are the amino acids that are involved in the active site. If you're interested in the catalytic cleft or the lysozyme catalytic site, what I highlighted was the catalytic cleft. If you're interested in the catalytic site, the active site where chemistry actually happens, you'll click on this. You notice that it's going to be amino acid 53 and amino acid 71. So if you click on that, you'll notice that E53, which is glutamic acid, glutamate 53, and aspartic acid or aspartate 71. Those are the two amino acids that constitute the active site of lysozyme. You can also look for the signal peptide. You can also look for the mature peptide. Everything that is found in this deposit can be seen and it's sort of annotated for you. But what we're interested in is the FASTA format. So if we click on FASTA here, we should have the FASTA format come up, and here it is. Okay, so the important thing about the FASTA format is this beginning caret. That caret is the beginning of the format known as FASTA. So you start with the caret, and then this first line is header information. So the header information basically tells you the name of the 
sequence or the name of the file. So since we're talking about lysozyme, we have the lysozyme precursor. This header information is something you can modify. And then the next line over actually begins your primary amino acid sequence. So this is what we'll highlight, we'll copy and paste that, and that will be the FASTA format. Again, it's very, very important that you recognize that what begins the FASTA format is that caret, that caret that faces to the left-hand side, and then the header information. So this is your accession number. This is what you can type in back into NCBI to recapitulate this, and this is just as continuing on the header is just the name of the protein. I could modify that accordingly. I can delete the accession number if I don't need it, but we'll just leave it as is. Let's look at the next one, mice lysozyme. So we can go back and type mice lysozyme, or if you know what the genus and species of mouse is, it's mus musculus, you can just type that in. Don't be inclined to just click on the very first entry point because the very first entry point, as you can see here, is not bacteria, it's not mice or mus muscalis. You have E. coli and a bunch of other bacteria. So that's not really hitting it. So maybe I'll just go and hit mice or mice or mouse lysozyme. After scrolling through approximately a bunch of other lysozymes from different organisms, I can also check out the 430 entry points for uh, the lysozyme from mice. I actually find it here, mus musculus, and I'll click on that. Notice it's a reasonable number of amino acids, mus musculus, lysozyme C1 precursor. And just as the same as before with human, I have my accession number here. So... I can put that automatically into my PubMed or, excuse me, my NCBI search engine, and this will pop up. So that's just the tag or the accession number. But then I can look all the way down. These are all the journals that reference that amino acid deposit. And just as before, I can figure out the active site. These are all shown highlighted in brown. I can look at the active site, the two amino acids that are found to perform chemistry. And I noticed just as before, I have an E53, that stands for glutamic acid or glutamate. And then I have a D71, which stands for aspartic acid or aspartate. So those are the two amino acids that are actually going to perform the chemical reaction. I can also look at a calcium binding site, which is going to be these three amino acids, one at 104, one at position 109, and another one at position 110, two alanines and a glutamine. And I can also look at the signal peptide as well as if I click on the mature peptide, the mature peptide gets highlighted. So all this information is related in this entry point, trusted in the FASTA format. And there it is. Here is our FASTA format. We can copy and paste that. And here is our answer once again to number one, part A. Again, the caret is going to be essential. It's very important that at the beginning of any FASTA file that you start off with the caret and then the appropriate header information. I could, we can do the same thing for carbonic anhydrase as well as malate dehydrogenase. We'll do carbonic anhydrase and I'll let you do malate dehydrogenase at home. So human is homo sapiens. So we can type human or Homo sapiens, which is the genus and species of carbonic anhydrase. And, well, that doesn't sound right, okay? A carbonic anhydrase really is not 11 amino acids. Go with what makes sense. And the deposit that's about 354 amino acid that contains the signal peptide probably makes more sense, makes more biological sense, that is. Everything is the same here. We can find out the active site, cleft, these amino acids that are involved in focusing the active site. We can also find out that this carbonic anhydrase has a region that binds zinc. So when we click on that, we see three histidines, one at 119, another histidine at 121, and then a third histidine at 145. This also has a signal peptide, so this is the precursor of carbonic anhydrase. It must get cut so that you get the active form of the folded protein. Let's go to the FASTA file 
and we want to emphasize that caret and that first line that is header information, and then we'll copy and paste that. Let's do mice lights design and then move on to question number two. So I can type mice or mus musculus, which is the genus and species of mouse. So here we have a 261 amino acid protein, a 437 amino acid protein, a 298 amino acid protein. So probably I'll go with the 437 one. That sounds a little bit more complete, though not necessarily just because it has more amino acids. Does it mean that it, ha it is the right entry? This probably has a lot of precursor sequence or signal peptide sequences. This also binds zinc. This is the mice version. And the mice version binds zinc. And those amino acids that are involved in that are histidine 205, histidine 207, and histidine 230. Again, we're interested in the FASTA sequence or the FASTA format. So we'll click on that. And now we have the FASTA format here. We copy and paste that. So human mice and mice carbonic anhydrates, human and mice lysozyme, roughly the same amount of amino acids. And we can go ahead and do the same thing for the human and mice malate dehydrogenase. One of the questions that is asked is, why compare the mice and human forms of these proteins? Well, that's a main theme of this class. The main theme of this class is looking for structure and from within that structure finding function. Also looking at conservation. So if there's a conserved proline or maybe a conserved disulfide bond, if it's in the mice version, uh, more likely we'll also find this in the human version of the same protein. So the mice analog gives us a lot of information about the human analog as well. So we don't need to isolate the human form if, when we are readily available to isolate the mice form. So one thing I would say is that we look at these to look for structure and hence function um, conservation. And you can elaborate on that as well. We can also say that there would be a conserved mechanism if, let's say, for example, zinc binding site for carbonic anhydrase is the same amongst human and mice. So that probably means the amino acids that coordinate zinc in carbonic anhydrase amongst these two organisms is the same. So that also implies a shared evolutionary origin, and it also implies probably a conserved mechanism. In this next question, it's asking for the accession number for each of these. So here we want to go back to the accession number and then look to see what is the signal peptide versus the mature peptide. So I'll just look at, for example, the human form of lysozyme. So I'll just pick up the accession number here. I'll put it back in the NCBI protein data bank. I recapitulated this. And what is available here? Well, we have a signal peptide. That's the first of 18 amino acids. And then the mature peptide. We also have the active site residues. We have the actual catalytic site, the catalytic cleft are all these amino acids. The two amino acids that will actually do the chemistry are here. And then we have a calcium binding site. So just for lysozyme alone, we have so many parts of the amino acid structure or the parts of the amino acids that have certain roles in the, fold, in the fold. So we can do that here. I'll just copy and paste this. So the accession number I'll highlight in yellow, though you can highlight in whatever color that you prefer. And if it's available, the signal peptide. So we know the first 18 amino acids are the signal. So like that, any color that you choose, but I'll just choose. And everything else is the mature peptide. So I'll just do gray for that. I will highlight just these two amino acids, the catalytic active site, 53 and 71. So there is my glutamic acid, and then my aspartic acid is going to be DRSTD, so DRST, I'll look for DRST, DRSTD, here is my active site residues for lysozymes. And then like that, we can also find the calcium binding site. So you can do that for the human mice version of the protein. Let's just go ahead and do the mice version and compare the human and mice lysozyme. I have my signal peptide, my mature peptide, and let's just highlight the calcium site for, let's just highlight the active site for the mice version of lysozyme. So coming back here, active site version for lysozyme 
is going to be E and D. The first 18 amino acids represents the signal peptide, and the rest represents the mature peptide. So let's highlight that. The first 18 amino acids represents the signal peptide. Everything else represents the mature peptide. And let's look for the E and D, which represents the active site residues. So let's go back to not the catalytic cleft, which holds the active site, but the actual active site residues, 53 and 71. So C-L-A-Q-H-E. So C-L-A-Q-H-E. There is my E. I'll move that red. And then D, D R S T D. So D R S D T D. So there it is again. So you can see here just by looking at the human version of lysozyme and the mice version of lysozyme, we see a lot of similarities. We see similarities in the active site residues. We see some similarities in terms of the signal peptide that guides this out of the cell. We can probably see same similarities if we look at the calcium ion binding site between the human form of lysozyme and the mice form of lysozyme. If we look at question two, it's being asked, what amino acids bind zinc in carbonic anhydrase? And what amino acids are part of the active site? Are they the same between mice and human? So let's answer this question. Let's look up first the human form of carbonic anhydrase. I can just put the accession number in. And the zinc amino acid binding sites are three histidines, 119, 121, and 145. So that is the human version. So we have 121, 119, and 145. Here's that first H, I'll underline it. And our next zinc will be 121, so that's just going to be right by it. And then our third histidine that binds zinc will be 145, so A-A-E-L-H. So let's look for an A-A-E-L, A-A-E-L-H. So those are the amino acids that bind zinc in the human form of lysozyme. And what about the active site? The active site for lysozyme are these six, or excuse me, seven amino acids. So we have NNGH, that's our first one. So histidine 94. I'll just write histidine 94 here for that. So the active site would be histidine 94 and glutamine 117, histidine 119, threonine 206. So we have the active site that's going to perform the reaction, and then we have the enzymes that will coordinate zinc for the human form of carbonic anhydrase. Let's do the exact same thing for the mice form and see if there's any similarity or if there's any differences between human and mice carbonic anhydrase. So I copied and pasted the FASTA format of the mice form of carbonic anhydrase, and I highlighted the zinc binding site of the mouse version, and I highlighted histidine 205, histidine 207, and histidine 230. There they are highlighted in red. Let's take a look at the active site residues for mice carbonic anhydrase. And the active site residues are going to be these seven amino acids, and they will be histidine 179, glutamine 203, So if we compare the mice carbonic anhydrase with the human carbonic anhydrase, notice the three histidines that bind zinc are conserved. And if we look at the active site residues, we have, if we compare this, I'll highlight this in green. With this, I'll highlight this in green as well. We have a histidine, glutamine, histidine, a histidine, a glutamic acid, a histidine, and a threonine. So we're almost perfect in terms of the sites that bind zinc for the zinc binding enzyme, as well as the amino acids that actually court, um, participate in the reaction of carbonic anhydrase. The next question asks you to identify the catalytic cleft of lysozyme, the amino acids that are part of this, the same or a difference between mice and human, and the mechanism. So obviously you're going to do the same thing as you've done before or we have done before with carbonic anhydrase except do lysozyme. Look at the catalytic cleft, those amino acids. If they're the same, you probably will recognize that there's a shared conservation and homology 
between the chemistry of mice lysozyme and human lysozyme. There's a lot of programs that will align and amino acid sequences and proteins that determine secondary structure content. Remember, secondary structure is your alpha helix beta sheet and random coil. So we're going to do a prediction using predictive software. So we're going to do this on lysozyme using secondary structure content prediction software. Control click. So Expazi has been around since the 1990s, and it contains all sorts of different, very uh, important websites that allow you to do in silico. In silico means via computer analysis of protein or gene structure. One of the things that it can also do is do secondary structure prediction using the Chow Fassman rules. So if we scroll down here, there are several programs that actually do it. So you can pick one and there's different algorithms. So we have studied Chow Fassman in the class. So we'll use the Chow Fassman CFSSP. We will enter the protein sequence in what format? So a lot of these programs that are going to predict and determine secondary structure or predict alpha helical regions or predict disulfide bonds, they utilize and work best under the FASTA format. To do the human lysozyme, I'll paste that here and we'll do predict. And that was pretty fast. So we have our prediction based on Chow Fassman rules, that 1970s landmark biochemistry paper by Chow and Fassman. And this is where it predicts would be a helical region or beta region or turn region. And this is its final structure based upon applying those rules and some statistics. So we'll just look at this here and we will make a note. We will make a note for human light design that our prediction software predicted 58% helical content, 39.2% beta content, and 11.5% turn content. So you compare the primary amino acid sequence but then the primary amino acid sequence may not tell you a lot about how the protein is going to develop into its native three-dimensional fold. So let's look at mice lysozyme. So let's take a look at mice lysozyme here and do the exact same procedure, inputting it into this Chow Fassman prediction algorithm. Putting in that FASTA sequence here and clicking predict, I get a fast turnaround here. And this is the predicted, according to Chow Fassman rules, secondary structure of the mice version of lysozyme. We'll take a look at what the algorithm predicts is the net result of secondary structure. And according to Chow Fassman, this would be 48% alpha helix. We're talking about the mice lysozyme. 47 or so percent beta structure and 13 percent mice lysozyme. So you can make a judgment call whether you con consider this conserved or different. I would probably say these are homologous and I would say that these are probably within reason, um, though that 10 percent difference in helical structure may ring alarms for some structural biology. The fact that we have conserved catalytic uh, active site residues and you will find out if the catalytic cleft is conserved between human and mice lysozyme, you can probably state that um, there is some degree of uh, structural and functional relationship and similarity between human and mice lysozyme. So not only can we predict secondary structure alignment, or we can predict beta turns, we can predict a um, whole host of computer-based technological um, programs that are way beyond my head that have gone above and beyond Chow Fassman. We can also line up amino acids. So this is a primary amino acid sequence alignment. We will have to take the FASTA format for the mice version, the human version, and the zebrafish version of lysozyme. So we can also do a lysozyme from E. coli. We can do a lysozyme from fungi, whatever it is. But let's line them up. And we'll use this algorithm known as Clustal W. This has been around for at least 20 or 20 to 25 years, and it performs a very decent and good job of performing primary amino acid sequence alignment. So in order to get Clustal, you can get it from the Expazi website. Nowadays, you can probably just Google Clustal W, and it should pop up as your first link. So here's Clustal W. So I will use the one from the Euro European Molecular Biology Institute, but you can use any link really. So we will need to use obviously the FASTA format when we line these up. So we'll do Clustal Omega, and then we have our three 
sequences in FASTA format that we'll type in. So first we'll input our human lysozyme. Now we already got the FASTA format for the human and mice lysozyme. And then I'll go ahead and get the FASTA sequence for the zebrafish lysozyme using NCBI, the protein data bank. Now the genus and species of lysozyme is Danio rario. It's 150 amino acids. That sounds as a decent size, so I will get it the FASTA format. I could save the FASTA format. I could send that file to my desktop or wherever I want to uh, on my computer, but for now I'll just copy and paste this to Clustol. I launched a multiple sequence alignment under Clustol Omega. Here are my three input sequences. It may be a good idea now to actually just modify my header. So I can just call this human lysozyme and I'll call this mice lysozyme and I'll call this zebrafish lysozyme. And now we'll avoid all these other options and just click submit. Some cases these get jammed because so many people use the server. So if that happens to be the case, just put your email in. So after you submit your alignment, your job will be successfully submitted and it should show up. You may have to wait and it may be up to hours or it could be some days or you can check on the status of your job here. And it looks like it's already done. So you can check your email or you can click on that link. And here it is. Here is our amino acid alignment. Now, in reality, we do multiple sequence alignment on thousands of organisms, or at least a hundred of different organisms of one protein. Here we're doing lysozyme from just three organisms. And we can see um, we can see those amino acids that match the lysines here, the arginines and the cysteines. So that cysteine and that cysteine line up that could, uh, keyword being could, be a site of a conserved disulfide bond. There's no real way of knowing. And we have a conserved aspartic acid. I wonder if that's part of the active site. We have a conserved glutamic acid. I wonder if that is also part of the active site. And then we have amino acids by the two dots that are the same um, side chain structure, same hydrophobic side chain, same acidic side chain, or same hydrophobic side chain. So those would be the two dots. The one dot would be the alignment where one of them is off. So here the serine is off. That is a polar side chain. In mice, based on the alignment, we have an alanine and a glycine. Both are hydrophobic nonpolar side chains. So we can put this into a way that we can visualize it. Um, to me, I copy and paste this. So you can copy and paste this directly into your answer sheet. And copy and pasting works really well. In case your font gets messed up, you can use Courier 9. And that seems to align things up very nicely. So if things appear out of whack, highlight, you want to highlight this whole thing that you just copy and pasted, go to Courier and then make it 9 or even can make it 10. Okay, once you make it to 11 or anything bigger, it starts to distort your alignment. So Courier 9 and Courier 10 is the, uh, it's a good way for visualization purposes. One final thing here, what I like to do is actually show the matrix and that's under the results summary. And there's a whole different trees and, and uh, the cluster alignment, the initial FASTA format, the input sequences. I like the percent identity matrix. So this is really interesting to me personally. Percent identity matrix will tell you how much one protein's primary amino acid sequence lines up with another protein's primary amino acid sequence. So for example, the human version obviously is going to be 100% lined up to itself, the human version. But the human version to the mice version is 74.32% identical. The human version to the zebrafish version is 38.19% identical. The mice version to the zebrafish, zebrafish version is 38.19% identical. So you see the human version and the mice version, they line up or they have more structural homology or at least sequence homology, I should say, than the uh, zebrafish version. So maybe the zebrafish version is sort of diverged in terms of its lysozyme structural and functional evolution. Question number five talks about PubMed. I like using PubMed whenever I do research papers, and you can get PubMed straight from the NCBI. So I just go straight to PubMed. There's different specializations of PubMed. Here's PubMed if you want to look at compounds. Here's PubMed if you want to look at drugs. Let's just go to straight up PubMed. Go to search, and here is our PubMed. All sorts of articles and interesting journals. 
If you publish a journal, make sure that journal is accessible to PubMed. Let's take a look and answer this question here. Paste an article from about carbonic anhydrase lysis and malate dehydrogenase. So I'll just look at carbonic anhydrase. So you can type in anything in your search query. If I'm interested in the latest in the literature concerning carbonic anhydrase, I type carbonic anhydrase and a review, and it will give me review articles of carbonic anhydrase. Okay, well, here's the first review article that I got. Bicarbonate transfer, transport during enamel maturation. It's from a dental. Well, I guess that's okay. How about this one? Understanding the role and mechanism of carbonic anhydrase 5. So notice that there's a lot of isoforms of carbonic anhydrase. There's 12 different isoforms of carbonic anhydrase. And here they're stocking. This group is talking about carbonic anhydrase 5, isoform 5, and its relationships to obesity. So that's a topic that seems interesting to me. So if I want more information about it, I can look at the PubMed ID number. Some cases, I can look at the full text of the journal. I can search for articles that are published in this journal, Current Protein and Peptide Science. So we'll just copy and paste for this assignment, this whole thing here, the abstract. And for your research papers, this is an excellent source. Okay. So it says cite one PubMed article. Um, usually when we cite a PubMed article, we, can, we cite the PMID number. At least that's what we do here. So instead of copying and pasting all of that, I'll click Escape, and then I'll click on the PMID number. So the PMID stands for the PubMed ID number, and... Uh, copy and paste the abstract. Well, let's just go ahead and copy and paste the abstract. So if you're interested in further reading the paper, you can, if the abstract interests you. So we'll just copy and paste the abstract as well. And probably with, can't really be an abstract without a title. So let's just go ahead and put the title in as well. Right? What's an abstract without a proper title? Okay, so that's one for carbonic anhydrase. The PEPMED ID number is actually crucial. So when we email across investigators or collaborators, we just email the PubMed ID number and then we plug in that number back into PubMed and we have all the information in our hands so that it could give us that citation. So that's how we communicate from one scientist to another through the PubMed ID number. All right, so you guys can go ahead and do the rest for lysozyme and malate dehydrogenase. You can actually look to see whether lysozyme is related to other diseases. So, for example, lysozyme and Alzheimer's disease. Is there a relationship or is there not a relationship? All right. So it looks like there is a relationship. Effect of natural biopolymer, biopolymers on amyloid fibril formation and morphology. So it does look like some papers have shown some relationship between amyloid plaques and lysozyme as a protein. So it's not just you can type Lysozyme, you can type in lysozyme and Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease or diabetes. If it's published and there's some relationship and it's cited by PubMed, PubMed should pick up that reference. Finally, we're going to look at the PI and molecular weight for the human and mice form of carbonic anhydrase. So we talked about calculating the isoelectric point. That is the pH where the neutral form of the protein exists. So let's go back to Expazi and look at programs that calculate isoelectric points. When we go to Expazi and we click down, we can go to identification with isoelectric point, molecular weight, or amino acid composition, or we can go under other prediction or characterization tools. This sounds interesting, compute PI molecular weight. This seems like this has what we need to answer this question. So we'll put in the faster format of the primary amino acid sequence of the human and mice form of carbonic anhydrase. So let's first put in the human form, as always, the FASTA format. I put in the FASTA format, remember that caret, the header information, and the, of the primary amino acid sequence for carbonic anhydrase. Obviously, you cannot calculate the PI of this 300 or so amino acid protein by hand. Let the computer do it. Anyways, we'll just leave that setting as is, and we'll compute the isoelectric point and the molecular weight. So here is the theoretical PI and molecular weight. The theoretical PI for the human form of carbonic anhydrase is 6.73 and the molecular weight is 39,450.93 Daltons. 
at 6.73. We also got the molecular weight. Let's do the same for the mice form of carbonic hydrase, anhydrase, and see what we get. Remember, we have to input the FASTA format in our sequence. As we can see here, the mice carbonic anhydrase has a theoretical isoelectric point of 4.74 at that pH uh, is where the zwitter ion will dominate. And the human form has a theoretical PI of 6.73 at that pH the zwitter ion will dominate. So the PI for the human form of this enzyme carbonic anhydrase, this protein, is more alongside physiological pH, which is around 7.5 to 7.6.